here with uh, Professor Jeffrey Frankel. Uh, he's Professor of uh, Capital Formation and Growth at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Welcome to Colombia again. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> uh, Professor Frankel, so first question, which obviously is uh, you were a uh, topic that you uh, managed very well. Um, let's start talking about the United States and uh, the current situation for growth in, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, so apparently in the past six months, we're having a little bit better numbers, kind of mixed with better numbers. Um, but the Federal Reserve still holding its view, or at least telling you know, to, the, to the markets that they're planning on keeping, in theory, interest rates on hold uh, in very low levels until at least the end of 2014. First, on growth. How do you see the situation of the U.S. going forward for this year? Because there's a lot of challenges going forward. Uh, Europe, uh, fiscal adjustment at the end of the year. Um, there's still a lot of things not working very well. Unemployment has been co coming down, but things are not that don't look extremely well. What's your view on the situation of U.S. growth for this year? So uh, U.S. growth has been uh, pretty steady, uh, not what we would like to see, especially coming out of such a deep recession but uh, nevertheless uh, pretty steady uh, for several years now and uh, there's a, been a bit of an annual cycle of thinking okay now things are going to be uh, much stronger and then, and then uh, tempering that and as you say there are these uh, risks that could uh, hit us at any time but um, you know I think we can do uh, two and a half percent growth this year if, uh, if, if none of the uh, worst case scenarios uh, shocks around the world and so on uh, materialize and uh, that's enough to bring the unemployment rate down very gradually as it as it as it has been again it's not the rate of job growth that we'd like to see in uh, in, a, in, a, in an expansion but it is consistent with our past uh, previous two recessions which were where the job growth lagged a bit behind and actually you know the rate of job creation in the United States uh, and particularly in the private sector over the last two years has been slightly better than it was uh, yeah, over the pre preceding decade, even if you take out the recessions, even if you just look at the expansionary period between 2002 to 2007. Nobody, nobody realizes that because, mm -hmm. of course, uh, the, 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 the unemployment rate level is still high and we're not really where we would like to be. But, so, but, there, but there are two, I, I guess, well, I have two, I'll give you both two concerns. Um, one, when it comes to unemployment, even though the, the unemployment rate has been coming down, uh, when you look a little bit further into the numbers, first there's a problem that long-term unemployment keeps being extremely high, it's at the highest level, or close to the highest level in over 50 or 60 years. Uh, second, the quality of employment uh, also doesn't seem to be very, very, very good. Uh, Part-time unemployment seems to be at a very high level, while full-time employment it seems, uh, I'm sorry, employment. Yeah. Part-time employment seems to be high right now, and, and full-time employment seems to be extremely low. Um, and also, um, the uh, participation rate in the labor force keeps on coming down. So, w would it be possible that maybe some of the progress that we've done on, uh, on unemployment so far, at least in the past few months, is going to slow down considerably, and then we're going to, to, to hold steady at a very, you know, around the 8% for, for a while? You know, until, until five months ago, the mystery was why uh, the people asked how come uh, the, the uh, growth of GDP is not being reflected in uh, jobs. So uh, we had, uh, we've had, some, we had three very, very good months, in, uh, relatively speaking, in job growth. I'm not so concerned about um, the part-time employment uh, or that. I mean, it's, it's a pretty uh, uh, standard thing that in the earlier stages of a recovery, firms are reluctant to hire uh, workers, and you see it show up in, in part-time employment, and you see it show up in, in overtime, the length of the work week uh, goes down in the recession and comes back before the firms are ready to hire more workers on a, on a permanent basis. So that part's not so worrisome. But the thing you mentioned at the first is, is very worrisome, which is the uh, very high level of long-term unemployment, because um, when people are out of the workforce for you know, a year or two years, they lose skills. Um, uh, it has a very high psychological toll, of course, but in addition to that, it has a lasting economic uh, uh, toll and you know, shows up uh, uh, permanently, at least for a long time, in the, in the natural rate of unemployment and in the uh, natural rate of growth. And we saw that in the, uh, 
in the uh, 70s and 80s took a long time to, uh, to, to come back from that. So that is quite worrisome. And, you know, in a sense, it's not surprising, just given how deep and long the recession was. But it is a, a, a very worrisome aspect of it. What about automatic fiscal adjustments? At the end of this year, uh, if nothing is done in Congress, uh, probably north of $500 billion of fiscal adjustments will take place uh, from 2013, which is about 3% of, uh, of GDP in the US. Are you concerned about that, especially because it's an election year? Well, the fiscal situation is extremely uh, concerning. Um, and I, I wouldn't say especially as fisc it's a fiscal year, except that, uh, uh, as usual, that's a kind of excuse to postpone doing anything about it until after the election. No, I mean, you know, it's, we've dis we discussed, uh, mentioned the fact that there are these big risks or shocks out there, and some of them are external, like uh, the, the euro or the price of oil, but some of them are homegrown. And uh, the U.S. inability to uh, manage its own fiscal situation in, in a you know, in halfway sensible way is, is quite, quite worrisome. I mean, it's, we're, we're as bad as the Europeans, and we don't have the excuse of 17 different uh, parliaments that are hard to coordinate. We just have one. And, um, you know, the solution to the fiscal situation, I think, is, is pretty obvious and pretty straightforward. Namely, we sh what we should be doing is simultaneously not withdrawing fiscal stimulus, which is what we are doing, um, but rather uh, uh, creating a little more fiscal stimulus because the economy is so weak. And yet, at the same time, lock in steps towards long-run fiscal responsibility. Not give speeches about how important it is and not promise impossible things the way uh, uh, some, some of the politicians who consider themselves the fiscal conservatives do, but actually take steps to lock in progress in the longer term and do that at the exact same time. But instead, instead of that quite sensible policy that I think most economists would agree on um, from across a pretty wide political spectrum, instead of doing that, we have these awful uh, political showdowns like we did last summer over the, uh, uh, the legislation to raise uh, the debt ceiling, where um, some, some of the uh, people in Congress were, were seem to be saying that there's no problem if we default on the debt, you know, that, that, um, which is just uh, amazingly irresponsible and contributed to our, uh, heavily to our being downgraded by Standard and Poor's um, from AAA to AA. And so I am very concerned that at the end of this year, November, December, um, that we may see something like that again. Because as you say, uh, if nothing is done to change any laws, we have uh, all of the Bush tax cuts uh, uh, disappearing. And some of that is not going to be such a bad thing, but, but all the Bush cut tax cuts disappearing, all the Obama tax cuts disappearing. And in addition, what's called sequestration, which is very drastic uh, cuts in both military spending and non-military spending. If the economy is hit with, by all that at once, uh, that, that would send us back into recession. So then what about the Fed? Should the Fed do more? You know, the Fed has done, has done so much, and, and uh, if, if it comes to that, if we're hit by any of these adverse shocks, the Fed should do more and will do more. But, but the thing is, well, there's not a whole lot more that monetary policy can do. Interest rates have been rock bottom for, uh, uh, for a long time now. And, uh, you know, the, the central bank does what it can do. But, uh, and the, in my view, is the primary responsibility should be fiscal policy. But a lot of half the economists in the U.S. are thinking still that, that their base, ca base case of the scenario is that the Fed is going to adopt more steps, you know, QE3, uh, in, uh, in later this year. Do you agree with that camp, or are you on the opposite camp? Well, I mean, the Fed, I don't think, is going to adopt some, it won't explicitly say we're doing uh, uh, QE3, quantitative easing 3. But I think it will continue to uh, do what it's done, been doing for several years, which is follow easy monetary policy and look for creative ways of, of doing that. Um, I don't think, uh, I think they're doing it right, approximately right, which is not to rush into something that might be called QE3 before the, there's a clear need for it. And also to keep your powder dry. I mean, if we reach a situation where everything that can possibly be done has been done, that might alarm the markets in itself. Right. So let's jump to the other side of the Atlantic, Europe. Um, okay, so we kind of passed the problem of Greece, kind of. Um, and now Spain is a big problem right now. Uh, you look at the numbers and it's actually very scary. Unemployment in Spain is at the highest level in decades, and it's the highest in the Eurozone. Um, youth unemployment is also extremely high. It's even higher than in Greece, which is north of 52%. Um, plus, you have a lot of fiscal austerity measures. Uh, how, how does Spain get out of this trap? 
because you know fiscal austerity, the markets are pressing for that. How is Spain going to come out from this situation in the short in the short run? I, I don't know. I do not have a good answer uh, to that question. I don't think anyone does. By the way, I don't think we're done with Greece. I think they'll be back. I agree with you. I <laughs> um, think Greece is going to have uh, another restriction <laughs> at some point. But you right. know, so far. That's right. No, no. I mean, the, the problem was uh, uh, kind of solved for the time being, um, and, uh, and 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 more generally, maybe with the eurozone. Just you know, we've had a, we've been coming through a period where the, it's eased up a little bit, partly thanks to the aggressive uh, actions of the ECB under 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 Mario Draghi, um, and partly uh, you know the new uh, the the, uh, uh, the technocrats in, in Greece and and, and, and Italy. But um, we I think we all knew that the problem was not uh, had not been solved or going it was not going to go away. It was going to be back pretty soon. And yes, uh, Spain is currently the front line, and it is very worrisome, and it is very hard to think of uh, you know what they should do. And in, in Greece's case, uh, well, one feels sim sympathetic for Greeks that are suffering. There's a sense in which it was their own fault uh, for, for uh, all the years of living beyond their means and of the, the uh, structure, all the structural impediments in the economy. In the case of Spain, I, I have a extra sympathy for them because I think they've had followed pretty good policies um, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or, or, uh, or more. And yes, they had a housing bubble, and, that, and the crash is what caused this. But they couldn't really respond to the housing bubble. Be, uh, uh, they can't really respond now to the, to the re recession because they don't have their own currency. They don't have their own monetary policy. So I mean, the case for the euro in general is certainly looking uh, weaker <laughs> than most people thought when it was uh, launched um, or in its, earlier, or its early years. Um, and you know, I have uh, all, uh, the various places where I think the policymakers could have made a different decision and things might have gone differently in, in managing the, the Greek crisis and, and, and so on. Um, but uh, it's very hard to answer the question of what should Spain do now. What do you think is going to happen with the Eurozone? Is the Eurozone going to be as it is today? I mean, the composition of it, is it going to be the same in a few years' time? Or do you think some countries are going to eventually be either expelled or drop out? Or you know, it's just, I mean, it's, it's such a hard question to answer. The, if there were some, some legal provision for countries to leave, then, then, then yes, of course, uh, uh, Greece first, and then uh, perhaps some of the others uh, would be uh, good candidates to leave. But they, they, they would, especially if, if you're going to default anyway, then that's a great time to uh, also uh, go back to your own, uh, own currency, and if that's what we think is in the cards for Greece. But I, it's just, um, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question. I, I, I suppose at some point uh, somebody will leave uh, the euro, if I had to bet. But, um, but, but the uh, costs would be, would be very high. It wouldn't, uh, um, you know, how do you do it? I mean, you start, if you start debating to, uh, the legislation, either at the national level or uh, at the treaty, especially at the treaty level to do it, then uh, uh, every last uh, you know drachma euro that's in the bank or peseta that's in the in one of those banks is going to be withdrawn in anticipation of uh, what the the fact that they'd be uh, devalued by a lot after they withdrew. So that gives you know that that uh, itself would uh, make the problem uh, make make the problem worse. <coughs> so um, I, I mean I, I'm very pessimistic on the euro crisis. Have been all, uh, all for two years. But I'm, I don't know that it's going to break up, and, 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 I, and I'm confident that it will. That even if a few currencies were to leave, that it will, it, the euro will go on. If you were an economic advisor for Angela Merkel, what would you advise her to do? Well, I think that uh, Angela Merkel is is making some mistakes. I mean, I understand it, the frustration of the Germans that the the German vo voters and taxpayers have from the very beginning and for 20 years have been worried. Their number one worry has been that the Euro uh, project would, uh, in the end, uh, result in them having to bail out some, uh, some uh, Mediterranean country that, that lived beyond its means. And, and the elites told them, no, no, we, we've got it all worked out. We have the Maastricht criteria. We have the no bailout clause. We have the stability and growth pact. And, but it turned out that the voters were right. Uh, uh, the taxpayers were right. And the leaders were wrong. So I understand exactly where the Germans are coming from. Having said that, I just think they're getting it wrong. If they think that austerity uh, promotes growth in any kind of short run sense, I mean, it's just wrong. And uh, you see it in Greece, you see it in Spain, you see it in the UK. 
uh, that doesn't uh, even you know, have the constraints. Um, and in addition, I mean, I think that's one mistake they're making. In addition, the proposals that Germans are making for how we will try to make sure that this doesn't happen again, uh, the fiscal compact, to my mind, is just uh, clearly not, uh, not workable. It's the same, basically the same thing as the Stability and Growth Pact, but just saying this time we really, really, really mean it. And um, you know, it's, it, it's very popular among economists and, and some policymakers to say the solution is to have rules. But rules that aren't credible, rules that don't have any enforcement mechanism, don't help the situation and maybe, maybe hurt the situation. I mean, a good test case for whether a rule is credible is if it's violated, if it turns out the budget deficit goes above the target, who does what? Who gets punished in some way, whether it's, it's political or you know, criminal in some way? And, and uh, writing, a, writing a fiscal rule that, that, that has that kind of credibility behind it uh, is, is, is quite difficult. And I don't think the Stability and Growth Pact was such a rule. It clearly wasn't credible. It was never enforced. And I, I don't see that the, the new proposals that are coming out of uh, 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 Germany and Angela Merkel in particular uh, 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 helped with that. Uh, I'll tell you about the fiscal rule. I'll ask you a question a little bit later about that because Colombia adopted a fiscal rule just uh, this year. Um, but before going into Colombia, uh, let me ask you about emerging markets. Uh, I saw an article that you wrote probably at the beginning of this year or maybe some, some, at some point last year. Um, I think the title was, Will Emerging Markets Fall in 2012? Uh, so I wanted to have your view on that, if you still hold the same view or if you're a little bit more optimistic on that view. Basically, just for the viewers to know, um, you were uh, a little bit pessimistic on what may happen for emerging markets, not necessarily 2012, although it was, that was the, the, the year that you put into the title, but for the next you know, two, three, or four years or so. Can you, can you explain us a little bit what was your, your, uh, your, your train of thought and what is it that you think right now what the, the outlook might see for, for emerging markets? Well, I mean, first, on a big picture, I have been for quite some time very bullish on emerging markets. I think we've seen an historic uh, change where, where uh, not all, but most uh, emerging market countries uh, have done quite well and have not just because of high commodity prices, but, but because of good, uh, good policies and they've learned a lot of lessons from the past. Um, and so the, the quality of the fiscal policy and monetary policy and, and uh, so on is, uh, is uh, much, much higher than in the past. And, and I, interestingly, uh, during the same period, uh, the northern countries, the US, uh, the UK, Japan, and the Eurozone have made a lot of mistakes. I think the quality of policy making among the most developing countries now is better than in, in, the, in the northern countries. And, and that's part of, the, of why they're seeing such strong growth. But in the, uh, the op-ed that you, you mentioned, uh, and it was, it was raised as a question, uh, will, will emerging markets fall in 2012? Um, but but I, uh, I, I did express some possible uh, worries, and I think some, some emerging market countries are vulnerable. What the, what the article said is uh, that there is this disturbing 15-year pattern, and I talk about the, uh, go, go back to the Bible, if you remember the story of, uh, of uh, Joseph, uh, uh, um, uh, interpreting the dream of the Pharaoh as uh, seven fat years followed by uh, seven lean years. And uh, that is uh, precisely what the pattern has been in emerging markets. We've, and we're, we're, we've gone through three cycles. So there were the big uh, inflows after the oil shocks from, let's say, 1974 to 1982. Those were the seven fat years. And then there was the uh, lost decade in Latin America, which is basically 1982, the crisis in 82. Uh, um, starting, and then uh, for most of Latin America, uh, 82 to 89 was, a, uh, was a, a very difficult time, the capital, net capital outflows and slow growth of any growth. So that was the seven lean years. And then it started over again with the uh, capital inflows of uh, 1989 to 96, those were the seven fat years. And then we had the East Asia crisis, uh, 97, and turn, continuing to uh, Russia and, and also eventually hitting uh, uh, to some extent, Brazil and everybody uh, uh, in Argentina, 2001. So, so uh, we're, we, that cycle is, uh, would say that uh, we're due again in 2012. Uh, that the, the, the if it's a 15-year cycle, two, uh, 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 1982 being the, the end of the uh, first uh, boom uh, and, and the first international debt crisis, and 1997 being the East Asia crisis, and then that gets you to 2012. 
Now, why, why? Is this just because it's in the Bible? No, I think it's because people tend to forget because uh, uh, 15 years is long enough that people have moved on to other jobs, you know, portfolio managers and, 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 and traders and all that. Um, and they think this time is different and they get carried away with the enthusiasm of what usually is uh, some, some genuine good fundamentals. Um, so I think that uh, uh, we, there is the possibility, I mean, we're almost halfway through the year and, 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 and emerging markets have been doing quite well, but you see slowing down. I mean, China would be the biggest concern, of course, and there is a possibility of a hard landing in China. Some slowing down is desirable, um, uh, coming off of uh, uh, last year where they had this uh, uh, clear overheating and the, and the, the, the real estate uh, bubble and the rest of that. And so there, a hard landing would take the form of the, the uh, problems, bad debts from the uh, uh, local governments and the banks and some of the loans that they made uh, based less on economic grounds than on uh, you know, other, other criteria. Um, I guess the single uh, major emerging market country that I think is most vulnerable at the moment is Turkey, because uh, they've had high growth, but I think maybe unsustainably high growth. They have a huge current account deficit. Uh, they'd be very sensitive to an increase in the price of oil, for example. So that one, I think, is pretty high risk. For Latin America, um, think things look good. But for example, if China did have a hard landing, then the demand for raw materials for, for, uh, for uh, uh, oil and minerals and agricultural products uh, worldwide would go down, prices would go down, and that would, that would have an impact on Latin America. Right, I was going to ask about China, so you already answered my question. But do you think China is following the steps of Japan? Do I think China's following the steps of, J of Japan? Well, in, in some respects, yes. And if you talk, look at the trade relations with the US, there's so many parallels. But um, I mean, China is, 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 is different. Japan, obviously, in, in many, many ways. Uh, and probably the most important way is that it still has a long way to go before income per capita catches up uh, with the United States. So what happened in Japan, and, and then subsequently in Korea and some of the others, was an inevitable growth slowdown. I mean, you don't go growing, uh, and, and China will have to, have to slow down. You don't grow at 10% a year uh, forever. If you're, if you're coming from way behind and you have uh, uh, low capital labor ratios and a high return to investment and uh, high, high productivity capital and uh, you're learning the technologies uh, uh, from the advanced countries by emulating them, I mean, that's, and it, it's not that easy to do, but once you find the for formula, you can really grow pretty rapidly. After your technolo technological knowledge has gotten close to the frontier and your management techniques uh, uh, you know, are close to the frontier, and after your capital st uh, stock is much higher, and you've started you know, by now, uh, built every train and every road and every bridge that you uh, want to build, then you start to slow down. That's inevitable. What happened to Japan is it was a very uh, uh, leveraged economy. The, the high uh, uh, dependence on bank loans worked fine when they were growing very rapidly, but that doesn't work, uh, I'm talking about corporations, source of capital for corporations. High leverage doesn't work when you slow down. And I think that's uh, a, a part, uh, a an overall diagnosis of why the Japanese economy basically crashed in the 1990s. And uh, Korea and some East Asia countries uh, went through something similar in uh, 97, 98. And uh, so China, uh, that's the question, will it have a hard landing uh, like that? You, we've all, we're already seeing uh, real wages go up, contrary to people who thought that the supply of labor, of low-skilled labor in, 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 in uh, China was infinite and you could never bid up the real wages. There, there was a, 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 the, the factories in the coastal provinces did run into labor uh, uh, capacity limitations and so they did have to start raising real wages and prices were adjusting and the, the renminbi is undergoing real appreciation and so China does adjust like other countries. But it still has a long way to go before income per capita uh, uh, approaches that of the U.S. or uh, other, uh, other Western countries. So uh, in that respect, I, I think that even if it were to have a hard landing or you know, uh, uh, a financial crisis somewhere along the way, it would be more like, more like what Korea's was in 97, 98, and then they'd pick themselves up and keep going. And, and so, so, so basically, I mean, China, like everyone says, is, uh, is going to pass the U.S. in economic uh, size. Uh, not as quickly as you would think by just extrapolating 10% growth rates, but, but they will pass us uh, before too long. Passing to the issue of commodities, which is also something that's important also for Colombia. Colombia has been experiencing, experiencing some sort of a, a, an oil boom, uh, mining also, but yes. mainly oil in the past few years. Um, you know, today exports, 50% of exports are oil, uh, inflow 
loads of foreign direct investment, you know, almost half also is uh, coming to, to the oil sector. Um, you've written extensively about the curse of natural resources. Uh, so Colombia decided to follow kind of the path of Chile uh, in implementing a fiscal rule in which uh, some of the, of the um, revenues that are coming from oil uh, are going to be put in a, in a fund which is going to be uh, saved uh, for the times where the you know, situation is not, not, not okay. Um, at the same time, there was a, a sustain, sustainable, fiscal sustainability law that was approved at a constitutional level, uh, oil royalties reform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Colombia started going through uh, this year. Actually, they started going through the path of a fiscal rule, which is very much linked not also to structural movements in the economy, but also to movements in the um, in the oil mining sector. Uh, what what challenges do you think a country like Colombia faces? Uh, at economic level mainly and social level, if you know more, ab more about it, I'm not so sure how familiar you are with Colombia, but you know, it's part of emerging markets, it's Latin America. Um, so what, what do you think are the challenges that Colombia is facing? Uh, also talking about this situation on, on a fiscal level, which, which has been improving substantially in the past few years. So I, I'm not in any uh, respect uh, an expert on, on Colombia, but um, as you say, I have been thinking about uh, uh, natural resources, uh, oil and minerals and agricultural commodities and the, the, the pitfalls that so many countries have uh, run into. And of course, there are countries that, that do very well with them, but what's been so striking is that they, in the past, they haven't been the, the majority uh, of natural resource countries that where, where performance has been disappointing. But um, I think uh, we, we do know uh, by now uh, what some of the pitfalls are and how they can be addressed uh, and, and by looking at mistakes that were made in some places and by successes uh, in other places. Certainly a part of the, uh, one of the biggest pitfalls is when there's a commodity boom and, uh, and of course it isn't just Colombia that's going through this, but uh, many countries uh, in, in Latin America, in Africa and other parts of the world are also undergoing uh, commodity booms and, or have been for the last uh, 10 years with a little, some, some ups and downs. Um, but oil prices are, are, you know, definitely have been, uh, uh, have, are, are, are way up. Uh, uh, and, uh, but but the, the one of the most common pitfalls is during the, the boom period when the price of your export commodity is high in world markets, you think this is going to go on forever and so we can spend it on, particularly if you're a country that still has a lot of poor people and uh, a lot of net it needs. Uh, then uh, there's a temptation to spend it. And many governments have actually increased spending more than proportionally to the increase in the uh, tax revenues or the royalties that they get uh, from uh, the boom. And then the problem is it doesn't go on forever. Um, in some cases maybe you run out of the natural resource, but more often it's just that the world price goes back down. And then you're stuck with uh, investment projects that are half finished, uh, or they're, if they're finished you can't afford to maintain them. And uh, you have a government payroll that's, uh, you know, that's now, in retrospect, is, uh, you expanded too, too big, too fast. And it's very hard to reverse these things. Historically, uh, in developing countries in general, especially commodity producers, especially Latin America, fiscal policy has tended to be pro-cyclical, meaning destabilizing, meaning the booms, you increase the spending and you increase the height of the booms, and then in the recessions, you have no choice but to cut back uh, on spending and, 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 and deepen the, 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 the downturn. It's the, the good news is, uh, since 2000, uh, a fair number of uh, developing countries, emerging market countries, have, uh, including some in Latin America, have beaten that, have figured out how to run counter-cyclical policies. And as you say, I think, uh, uh, that while there are other examples, Chile is kind of my star uh, example in this case, because it doesn't just depend on uh, the, the, the intelligence and, uh, of the, uh, uh, and good uh, judgment of the, of the uh, government officials, but they've written, written rules, um, and it is a, 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 a structural uh, a budget, budget rule that the government has to set a, uh, a, a target for the cyclically adjusted uh, budget and then save everything. If, if it's an increase, of course, in Chile's case, it would be copper prices. If there's an increase in the price of copper, uh, it, to the extent that that's uh, permanent, you can spend the revenue, but if it's temporary, you have to save it. And, and I gather that's uh, quite similar to what uh, you have enacted in, uh, in, uh, in Colombia. Um, my, my research ha uh, lately has been focusing on the fact that many countries that have adopted rules haven't really succeeded. The spectacular case is the Stability and Growth Pact in, uh, 
in, uh, in Europe that we were discussing earlier, but it's true in many other parts of the world. And uh, if a rule is not, not credible or not enforceable, it's not going to help, and it, it, it can sometimes even make things worse. Um, the one aspect of Chile's fiscal institutions that I have really focused on and admire, and I think maybe is, the, is a, a, a key, a critical element, has to do with who it is that says whether a boom, or whether it's a copper boom or an oil boom or just a, a, a big expansion in, in the economy generally, who says whether that's permanent or transitory? Who says whether it's structural or cyclical? Because it's very hard to say, of course. Uh, we, we economists can't, can't, we don't, can't be sure what the right answer is. And so what happens in so many countries is, is wishful thinking, overly optimistic forecasts. I studied for official government uh, uh, forecasts for 33 countries and found in most of them, they were systematically biased towards over-optimism, especially at the longer horizons and especially during a boom, that you, you would think a boom is going to go on forever, even though it isn't. Well, that will destroy any rule, because you just say, this is what the European countries did, the Euro countries, every time they were above the 3% limit that they were supposed to hit for budget deficits, which was often, almost without exception, they would always forecast, we're going to go back down next year, uh, get our budget deficit below uh, the 3% limit, even though usually they didn't. And so it's a pretty comprehensive uh, property. So what Chile has done, which I, I think is the obvious explanation for why they don't have this bias towards over-optimism, their, their, their forecasts uh, ha have, uh, have been, uh, if anything, pessimistic on average. It's not uh, politicians, it's not government officials, it's nowhere, nobody in the subject to the political process that makes a determination. They have these independent commissions uh, uh, of experts, one for the price of copper and one for the income, that says uh, what's structural and what's cyclical. And so I think maybe that's why that system has worked. I don't, now I don't know enough about the uh, Colombian case to know uh, so, how you're handling um, that. Last question. What should emerging markets do about appreciation of currencies right now? Central S banks, government officials. So I understand it's a, a big issue, and I know that Brazilians uh, are, are hot and bothered about the cu currency wars, and I understand that the, the strength of the currencies of which the uh, Colombian uh, peso and the Brazilian real have been very, uh, very strong uh, can create uh, problems uh, for, for other sectors, uh, for, uh, manufacturers or whatever. Um, but uh, I think some amount of appreciation makes sense in a commodity boom. I, 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 I don't think you'd want to have kept the exchange rate fixed. Um, in, in addition, if, if you're in a period where the United States and other northern countries are in recession and, an e and they think correctly that an easy monetary policy is what makes sense for them, and you're Brazil uh, uh, or Colombia and uh, you're in a position of uh, much stronger growth and a tighter monetary policy makes sense for you, then that's what we have floating exchange rates for. Um, that's why they're invented, uh, 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 so to speak, um, because then the uh, country that, that needs the loose monetary policy can depreciate. Not that that's a deliberate intent of the Fed, but it's a side effect. And the currencies that, 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 that are uh, in strong, in over, countries that are in danger of overheating, uh, like, uh, like Brazil and Colombia, and it should be China too, uh, can, can, can appreciate. Having said that, there is such a thing as too much appreciation. And if you just do it through pure uh, floating, uh, you can get too much. And um, so I am in favor of, of managed floating. I'm in favor of, of intervening that uh, when you have these big inflows the way Colombia has had, that uh, you add to reserves, uh, that you, you take part of the increase in demand for your currency by increasing the supply of your currency and only part of it through uh, appreciation. And then in addition, you try to uh, do some amount of sterilization so that the inflow, the increase in reserves, is not completely reflected in an increase in the domestic money supply, because then you just get it in terms of inflation rather than appreciation. And raising reserve requirements uh, is one way to, to do some of that sterilization. So I'm, I'm not uh, you know extreme float or extreme fix uh, person. I believe in doing a doing a, 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 a managed float with, with uh, some, at, some reserve accumulation. And, and, and some sterilization. No capital controls? Well, capital controls, I mean, there's some people who might say that raising reserve requirements for banks on, on dollar liabilities is a form of capital control, but I wouldn't say that. Um, uh, Colombia, I know, has experimented in the past with capital controls, and I think, I think pretty successfully. Uh, I mean, Chile gets all the fame for some reason uh, that uh, Chile used to have this uh, 
in the 80s and 90s, these uh, 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 controls on, uh, uh, which mainly changed the composition of capital inflows, not, didn't reduce the total, but I think changed the composition in a desirable way to reduce short-term dollar-denominated bank inflows. So under certain conditions, I think uh, that the capital controls can be useful too, but they're also prone to abuse. Right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.